Okay. Yes, last night we talked about something better than luck. It's a message God gave me this uh, summer, uh, actually early fall. And um, luck is what the world lives by, gambling, luck, hope my ship comes in, all these kind of things, the way the world operates. And uh, some people get lucky, coincidence, whatever. But uh, God has given us three guarantees that's better than luck. One is being generous. The measure you give will be given back to you, pressed down, shaking, sh- shaking together, running over. The measure you give, the measure will be back, given back to you. And I can tell you that you cannot outgive God. You cannot do it. And it's a guarantee. Second is favor. The Bible says His favor surrounds us like a shield. It's Psalm 512. And uh, the favor of God is the same as the, as the word grace. And there's uh, some excellent stuff out you can get on that, but Literally, we have all the favor of God if you have Jesus Christ. And if your trust is completely in His blood and His righteousness as your righteousness. Sometimes we don't even realize we think self-righteous thoughts. We think, uh, well, you know, I've been doing pretty good. Maybe God will answer this. It doesn't work like that. It's always His righteousness. It's always by the blood of the Lamb. But because of His blood and righteousness, we can claim all of His favor in everything. Not just uh, a parking place downtown. I mean, where you can get it all, all, all in anything. And uh, it's amazing. Actually, I was thinking about it as far as health. Uh, one of my spiritual moms, who's been used in the miraculous uh, probably as much as anybody I know, uh, she's prayed at least, I, I know of at least three, I think five, maybe six times, for people to have who didn't have something in their bodies to appear, uh, a kidney, a um, kidney. Just, I mean, absolutely supernatural stuff. This lady has been used of God in just incredible, miraculous ways. In fact, our assembly has got a nomination. Just gave her a legacy award in front of the whole denomination in Chicago last year. And uh, uh, she does what she calls body maintenance. And every morning, she just lays her hands on parts of her body. She has any aches, whatever, and uh, just claims she's seventy-seven now, and uh, her skin still looks like she's forty. Uh, you just, you just, you have favor. You have, you have an unlimited potential. I'm, I'm going to probably, if I move too much into hyper faith, I'm going to lose the whole congregation. So I better stop there. But uh, the other thing you have besides favor and the uh, guarantee of being generous, what God will bless back, is you have all the promises of God, and they're all yes and amen. And we live by the promises of God. Okay, that's not my message, um, but I do want to give you this verse. Can you put up Hebrews one fourteen real quick? since Roger made allusion to this, because we don't, there's a lot of things we don't think about a lot, and this actually proceeds into the message um, for those who weren't here first hour. And then we're going to go to Exodus 3. Uh, but if you, do you have Hebrews 1.14? Is that possible? Here we go. Therefore, oh, can we have New American Standard? Yeah, the New American Standard version. Wait, I don't know what that is. 1.14.14. 14. Angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who are inherit salvation. Uh, Hebrews one fourteen, just that verse and New American Standard. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'll just I'll just read it to you. I don't like the NIV. No offense to all you NIVers. Uh, well, it's a dynamic paraphrase, and uh, there's just some things I. Anyways, that's not worth talking about. Uh, Hebrews one fourteen. Are they not all? Are they not all ministering spirits? or angels, sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. So what Roger said is actually very biblical. Every believer has an angel. Every believer has an angel. So uh, we welcome all the angels here today. (laughs) All right, Exodus 3. We talked about this first hour. In my quiet time, May 23rd, this uh, late spring, I I read the Bible through systematically. Um, I read 10 chapters a day. I had read uh, in Exodus 2 the day before, May 23rd, the 22nd. May 24th, I read Exodus 4. But in Exodus 3 that morning, uh, and if you'll go there, I, I'm gonna, I, I wasted too much time first hour giving the background of this text. And uh, I'm not going to do that, so you can get first hour message if you want. But let's get right to the text. The text that got opened up to me, this is Moses in the wilderness. This is Moses doesn't know the Lord. He doesn't know the Lord. He's had a burning bush experience. He's, he's at the Sinai. 
uh, and this is before he brought the children of Israel to Sinai. This is where he met God. And um, the burning bush experience is where Moses, who did not know God, basically a pagan, uh, raised in Egypt by the Pharaoh's daughter, even though he's a Jew, did not know the God of the Bible. He meets him at the burning bush. That just happened to be the location also where Mount Sinai is and the Mount of Oreb, the Rock of Oreb, which we went into and you can hear about that first hour. So here's what happens in verse 10. Therefore come now, and this is God speaking to Moses. I will send you to Pharaoh so you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, sons of Israel out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. Now, we have to understand, Moses left the heritage of Egypt. He was lying in line to be the next Pharaoh. He found out that these Jewish slaves that Egypt had had for 400 years, generation after generation, he found out that he was Jewish blood. And he made a decision, according to Hebrews 11, to forsake the riches of Egypt to associate with the slaves, the Jewish people. Huge decision. And so he did, and then he decided God had called him to deliver the people of Israel from slavery out of Egypt. And his first attempt, he killed an Egyptian, and the Egyptians turned on him, and the Jews turned on him. So he fled into the wilderness for his life. And he met his wife, and he tended sheep for 40 years. It was during that time he had this burning bush experience, which, and we can prove this to you, um, I mean, gave reference to that first hour, but the Mount Sinai that he met God and the burning bush and the Mount Rock of Oreb was actually in Saudi Arabia, not in Egypt. And the Bible actually says Mount Sinai is in Arabia. And that's in Galatians. Uh, and there's a video on that by Bob Canuck uh, that you really need to see in search of the real Mount Sinai. It's very, very, very powerful. And so he meets God. And I want you to see this verse 10. Now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh. That is, this guy is a nobody in the desert with some sheep. Egypt was the largest empire in the world. Pharaoh was the largest man, I mean, tyrant, dictator, powerful man in the world. And God says to Moses, tending sheep, uh, he's got a shepherd's rod. Go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. All these Jewish slaves for 400 years, go tell him to let them go. I say so. I mean, you talk about an impossible mission. You talk about an overwhelming purpose God called him to. Moses says in verse 11, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Verse 12, And he said, Certainly I will be with you, God says, and this shall be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain, which was Mount Sinai, way before time. So he already knew where this location was from this experience with his sheep down there in the wilderness. In verse 13, Moses said, now this is the key verses. I'm going to do something I didn't do first. Time. I'm going to read down to 20 uh, this time, but we're going to key in on verses 13 to 15. Then Moses said to God, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel and I shall say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, Moses talking to God, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name 
to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite, Jebusite to the land flowing with milk and honey. And they will pay heed to what you say. And you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt and you will say to them, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So now please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. And I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be that when you go, you will not go out empty handed. Right. Do you realize how unbelievable this is? Here's Moses. He's a, he's a sheep herder in the wilderness with his family. God shows a burning bush, speaks audibly through a burning bush. Tells him, go to Pharaoh? No. This is the big city, big palace, lots of guards, lots of power, lots of money, lots of... He's, he's the biggest empire. I tell him to let my people go. And he's going to do it because I'm going to do all these miracles. And he's going to let you go. And you're not going out empty-handed. I'm going to make them load you down with all kinds of precious things. Really? But, by the way, that is what happened. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters, thus you will plunder the Egyptians. You know, it's amazing how many Christians live not just in the world, but of the world. And God said to be in the world, but not of the world. And, and we want what the world has. And God says, I want to give you, I want to give you what the world has. And I'm going to do it my way. I shared first hour just to introduce this. Back to Exodus 3, 13 to 15. This is what we ought to spend our time meditating on. What does it mean when you ask your God, who are you? And he answers, I am who I am. I hope you begin to feel this morning how important these words are. There aren't any words more important than these. Any words that you think might be are important only because these words are true. The more you ponder them, the more awesome they become. That is true. That is what's happened to me since May. I'm having a quiet time, May 23rd, Monday morning, down in Peoria, in my little office, in my up two, two-story flat apartment. And uh, God opened up Exodus 3, 13 to 15. And it was one of those moments where I literally was just shocked. I, I started writing in my journal and I realized I had never really meditated on this portion of Scripture. I'd never really studied it. I'd never really presented it. It's not an insignificant thing. God says to Moses, this is how he introduces himself to Moses. And I, I want to read it one more time, but let me finish this little writing here. The more you ponder these words, the more awesome they become. That's what's happened to me uh, since that time with this particular message and this particular scripture. I know I can't do them justice. Perhaps the Holy Spirit will. And after I finish first hour, I actually have felt this every time. I can't give to a congregation I preach this to the experience I had. Only the Holy Spirit can. But we're going to pray right now and ask God to increase your revelation, which means the word becoming flesh experience of his words. Because God doesn't want us just to hear the words in our ears and go into our head. That's how we get knowledge in a classroom. God wants his word to go into our ears, our head, our eyes see, and our heart receives, and there's an experience to it. And uh, this is so absolutely fundamental. So let's pray and ask God to speak to us in the next few moments. Father, I pray this hour, this group, 
Those who have stayed over, those who are new. I ask you to increase our revelation of your identity, of your words, the experience that you, I believe, want us to have just like Moses. Oh God, I thank you. You have never changed. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. We worship you this morning. We worship you, King God. We worship you, the great I Am. We bless you. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to reveal the Father to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So first hour, I'm just going to review real quick the seven points that I gave. You can get the message and listen to them. Number one, God exists. When he says, I am that I am, which is not really a name. Moses said, what do I tell him your name is? Tell him I am that I am. Right. That's a weird name. Tell him I am that I am. He is saying, I exist. By the way, there's a lot of implications in that. Everything that exists, exists because he exists. Period. Period. Number two, there's no reality. Everybody say no reality. There's no reality apart from God. There is no reality outside of God. In, on college campuses, people say, well, you got your reality, I got my reality, you got your view, I got my view, you got your your God, I got my God. It's all, you know, it's whatever your man chooses. Uh-uh. One God. One reality. We either get into it or we miss it. But it's the only one. There is no reality apart from God. God, number three, does not change. I am that I am. Present tense, not past tense, not future tense. I am that I am. Always the same. The Bible says he's immutable. The Lord our God changes not. Number four, uh, this is one of my favorite ones. God is an inexhaustible source of energy. I went on a little tirade running around here because I feel this constant surging energy in my body, my spirit, my emotions, and my mind. God is our source, and he's in us, and there is nothing he can't do. Nothing is impossible for him. In fact, I was thinking about it first hour, then I was sitting here between services thinking to say more about that. I, I should have expounded on nuclear energy. Just think of electrical energy. Think of all the power of different things. Electrical energy, Atomic energy, atomic bombs. I just think of that energy. God created all of it. God's the source of all of it. In other words, I'm trying to overwhelm you that he has a lot more energy than you think. And he's in you. I'm getting, I'm getting some static. Is that me? <laughs> That's good. Give me five. That was really good. <laughs> that was good. She said it was him. He's just saying, he's, his energy is just going through the room. <laughs> you know, that was good. I, you're faster than I am. That was good. Yeah, so when you're tired and overwhelmed, you can tap it. He says, you that are tired and weary, wait on me and I'll build up, I'll renew your strength like an eagle. Number five, his existence and truth, reality, his existence and truth and reality demands objectivity. He completely annihilates the idea of a God of our own making. We, people, people tend to want to make God in the image they want Him to be in. We pick and choose out of the Bible how we want to see God. The real God demands objectivity. He is who He is. He doesn't cater to how we want Him to be. We need to cater to how He wants us to see Him in His totality. So we, it demands objectivity. He is who He is. He doesn't change we need to break into it. Now, there's things about God people don't like. Like, people hate the idea that there's a hell. Roger mentioned hell. God, my God, my God, there's no hell. You might want to get to know that God. You might want to know why there's a hell. By the way, everything God has created, everything that exists, is in character with himself other than man's sin. Now, here's another interesting thing. Anything that exists even hell, all, everything has to be in line with his character. So the Bible says God is love. 1 John 4, 8, 1 John 4, 16, twice, same chapter. God is love. He's not a God of love. He is love. 
If he is love, that's who he is. People think, well, he's a God of love, and if he's a hell, he's a God of wrath. No, he's not a God of wrath. He is love. So if he has wrath and he has hell, it's because of his love. You need to find out why. Because when you get that revelation, you'll weep like I did for a whole evening with two of my buddies. He does that in this series? You will weep when you recognize why he has wrath and why he has hell. It's because of his love. See, we need to understand his reality. His existence, his truth, his reality demands objectivity. Number six, we must conform to God, not him to us. And that is very, very key. And number seven, God has drawn near to us in one way. And this annihilates every religion in the face of the earth and the history of mankind. God did not invent religion. Jesus actually told us in Matthew 13, the devil would. He would sow all these false tares of religions. God has drawn near to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. In him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John 8, 58. Jesus said to the Pharisees after this incredible sermon he gives to them, and they're challenging him, challenging him, and challenging him. And he says, you don't know me. Because if you know me, you'd know the Father. Because I came from the Father. This is John 8, 40 to 58. He says in there, he says, you're of your father, the devil. Not the nicest thing to say to the religious leaders of Israel who are supposed to represent Jehovah. They weren't happy about this. Then, just to drive the point home, he gets to the end of his message and he says, before Abraham was, I am. And he used the phrase, I am, that no Jew would speak because it's so holy. And they picked up stones to kill him. I mean, think about it. Jesus said, I am. That God that Abraham and Moses met, that existed before Abraham, that's me. God has drawn near to us through Jesus Christ. Now, I want to just reiterate some things about this passage. First of all, I want, to, I want you to look again at verse 14. God said to Moses, uh, when he asked him, who do I tell the Jews? Who do I tell them who you are? Who sent me? He says, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God furthermore, verse 15, said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Notice this phrase now. This is my name forever. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations, which means in Nuglaris in 2016. The same God that revealed himself to Moses is revealing himself to us. Now, um, that's not me, is it? Okay, okay, Don, thanks. Give me ten facts about God from the great I Am. This was not in first hour. This is all new stuff. Number one, he has no beginning. We can't comprehend that, but he has no beginning. Time has a beginning. The universe has a beginning. Creation has a beginning. You and I have a beginning. God has no beginning. Number two, it means that he has no ending. He didn't come into being, therefore he can't go out of being. He is being. He fills all in all before there was ever a universe or creation or an earth or a solar system or anything in the universe. Before there was outer space, there was God filling all in all. To make the universe, he had to section himself off. He had to deny himself. And he kept denying himself. He made planet Earth. He made creatures. And then he became one of them. And he's lived a life of self-denial to do what he's done. Number three, his absolute being remains... And this is this. His absolute being, number three, means he is absolute reality. There are no other realities than what he has created. The world's reality is absent of him so it's easy for them to think he doesn't exist. He exists in the world's reality even though they don't recognize him. And, and by the way, that is as real 
as I shared first hour, as the fact that the sun comes up every morning. Do you know the sun coming up every morning is the reality of God? I'm not saying the S-U-N is God. I'm saying God created it that every night, every person worldwide in the history of the planet goes to sleep and it gets dark. I'm not talking about people who work nights and get up. I'm, we're talking normal people. <laughs> not you nurses that work third off shift. He has made it that we sleep in the dark and we wake up in the light. We sleep in the dark, we wake up in the light. Sin puts you to sleep. Sin can take you into an eternal sleep. Death is also called sleep. We wake up every morning to the light. That in itself is not a coincidence or a a quirk in science or just something that evolved. God made it that way to be a message. So how do you say that? I'm glad you asked. Genesis 1.14. Genesis 1.14 says God made the sun and moon and stars to be a sign. To be a sign. God said that the sun, the moon, and the stars and the seasons are signs. Telling what? A sign always points to something or tells you a message. It tells you something or it points to something. God said he made the sun. Genesis 1.14, first chapter of the Bible. The sun, the moon, the stars, and the seasons are signs. Signs what? Pointing to him. And people see, you ask any human being, Hey, have you ever seen the sun? Yeah. Hey, have you seen the moon? Yeah. Hey, did you know there are four seasons and they change? Yeah. You ever seen them? Yeah. Crazy? Of course. You're an idiot to ask those questions. Might I add, you're an idiot not to see what they point to. The one who made them. Not, Not to mean to be derogatory there, but I'm just saying... He who says there's no God, the Bible says, whoever says there's no God is a fool. God is reality. The absoluteness means he's independent. Number four, he's independent of everyone and everything outside of creation. He's the creator of everything and still is. Number five, everything that is not God is totally dependent on God. Everything that's not God is totally dependent on God. Everything that has... uh, Everything that has that's been decided to live independent from God is isolated from God. So everything that God gives the right to live independently from Him is isolated from Him. And if it dies, it remains in that condition forever. There's only one creature God allowed to live independently from Him. And it's not the birds and animals and insects and fish. Only humans have allowed the choice, if they want to, to live independent from him. In the moment, that's what sin is. Sin is a choice. It's been said for my whole lifetime, I've heard the phrase, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it was their declaration of independence. What we want to do when we come to Christ is make our declaration of dependence on God. But when man makes his sinful choices, he's saying, I declare myself independent from God. The moment he does that, he isolates himself outside of God. Whoever dies in that condition remains in that condition forever. Number six, everything that has come into being and exists is only because God has called it into being and it only exists because he's decided to let it keep being. There'll be a day where he will cease things that are existing. Everything in comparison or apart from him is nothing. Well, now that one, I don't don't have time to go into all these. These are philosophical statements of truth. But if you think about that one, you'll get a whole different view of what you value and what it means to be separated from God or not to be separated from God as far as what humans value. If something has removed itself from the reality of God and is isolated from God and remains in that condition forever, they have lost all value because only God gives value to anything. Do you know why you're valuable? Do you know why humans are worth more than dandelions? Turnips? Squash? Do you know why? Because God has set His love on us. God loves the trees and the birds and everything, but we have more of God's love than the trees. 
Do you know there are people in California that love trees more than humans? Humans are expendable. You can get those real easy, but redwoods take hundreds of years. They'd rather kill a human being than kill a redwood tree. God says he put his value on humans. Isn't it amazing? You know what liberalism out of God leads to? Insanity. Listen to me. I didn't share this first hour. I have a girl in my college group in Peoria. She's a super intelligent teacher and uh, very sharp in every way, humanly speaking, but liberal. And this, this semester, they've been discussing genderism versus sexuality. And whatever sexual parts you're born with is not determine your gender. This is, I, she recorded a whole lecture of a class and I listened to it verbatim last week. Your gender is not determined by your sexual parts. You choose what you want to be. You choose your gender. Oh, you've been influenced by those major influences, your parents. They saw your sexual parts and said, oh, we have to train you to be like this. But we've been set free from that. One girl piped up during the lecture and said, well, that's so true because she said, today I'm a male. She's a girl. She said, I'm, today I'm a male. And she goes, uh, and she said, oh, really? And she goes, yes, I, yeah, some days I'm a female. Um, but I think I'm more male than female. It depends, but I tend to think I'm more. She said, really what I am is a free male. And the teacher's response was, oh, oh, I mean, it was like two plus two equals four. She just talked like it was normal. And I'm listening to this lecture going, this is insanity. God's got to come down on America, gang. We're losing our minds. But you know what? A great philosopher said years ago, Demosthenes, he said, when man ceases to believe in God, he doesn't believe in nothing. He believes in everything. God is the reality that makes things normal. The more away from God you are and belief in God, the more abnormal you become. It is insanity what is happening in America. We need a revival. His absolute being means he is constant and he doesn't change. There's pi, 3.14. It never changes. There's a speed of light, 186,300 miles per second. 2 plus 2 equals 4. He never changes. He is more constant than constants in math. He cannot be improved. He cannot be diminished. He is perfect. Hallelujah. Number eight, his absolute being and perfection reality means he is the absolute standard of truth. He is truth. Also, he is goodness and he is beauty. He himself is the standard of everything right, everything true, and everything beautiful. By the way, I believe when we see God face to face, we will see in that moment the essence of all the beauty in the universe. Now, I've seen some beautiful sceneries in my life. I've, I've had times in Japan at Mount Fuji. I've been to Hawaii. I've been, I've been, I've been, we've been, my wife and I have gotten to go to some places. I've seen some beautiful, beautiful things. Some beautiful sunsets, some beautiful mountains, some beautiful lakes and rivers. Beautiful scene. I'm telling you, Whatever you think is beautiful, whether it's a baby or whether it's a, a beautiful woman or whatever, a beautiful creation, a beautiful uh, flowering plant, uh, some super colorful bird, the essence of all beauty is Him. When we see Him, we'll see the source of all beauty. David talks about meditating on the beauty of the Lord. There's a revelation for you you can think about. Number nine, his absolute being means that he can do whatever he pleases and it's always consistent with his absolute truth. His absolute being, I am that I am, means that he can do whatever he pleases and it's always consistent with absolute truth because he cannot contradict himself. He is utterly free from any constraints that don't originate from the counsel of his own will. Number ten, his absolute eternal being means that he is... The most important, the most important, most valuable, most beautiful person in the universe. He is more worthy of interest and attention, admiration and enjoyment 
than all other realities, including the whole universe put together. He should, he deserves, he compels us to worship him. He should be worshipped, he deserves it in every way, every day. And let me explain what that means. Do you know, if you want to move more and more in the reality of God, make every aspect of your life a choice, a value, and a belief, and a dedication to worship. I cannot tell you that young people that I've pastored, and they'll get into a job after graduation, and they hate the job. And I'll say, why don't you do this? Why don't you go there as an act of worship and to be a representative of God? The moment they totally embrace that, and they decide, I am here as long as I'm here. I believe God is bigger than me being here, and it's time to leave. He can make me get out of here. I don't have to pull strings. I don't have to do this or that. And as long as I'm here, I'm a representative of God before I'm a t- school teacher, before I'm an engineer, before I'm a construction worker, before I'm a housewife. I'm a representative of God. I'm here for God. And my, my, my work of my hands, whether I'm doing dishes, or I'm doing engineering, or I'm, I'm plowing in a field on a tractor, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it as an act of worship. I can tell you the moment you adopt that with all your heart, your situation, circumstances, and emotions are going to change. And I'll show you what else is going to happen. The moment you dedicate whatever you do, no matter how mundane, but you know it's something you're supposed to do. It's a responsibility. You dedicate to God to be God's representative, to be there for God, and to do it, then to do it as an act of worship to God. Because you know you can worship God through the work of your hands. The Bible actually tells you that. The moment you do that with all your heart, not only are you going to change emotionally and mentally and have a new fulfillment, God is going to show up in that reality. I am that I am. Now, that was powerful. I mean, that was a whole sermon, right? There. That was worth the whole sermon, right there. Just that, and I'm still in the intro. Help me, Lord. Now, the two questions that Moses asked him, God answers. Very clearly, right at the beginning, the two questions Moses asked him, who do I tell them that sent me? And he says, uh, and then he says, I mean, let me go back to the questions Moses asked in verse 13. Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I shall say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now, they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Two big questions. God answers with three answers to those two questions. First of all, he says, I am that I am. Number two, he tells them, I'm sending you. And number three, he says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, we're going to bring some real specific application to this this hour, more than we did last hour. Um, I want to just go into that now, and I'll save save some of this other stuff I have that's just for sake of time. Number one. I'm just going to go right to the personal applications because there's a lot more philosophical stuff I could share with you and stuff, but I just want to give this. Number one, personal application. God says, I am that I am. Not I was, not I will be, not that I do that I do. Dick Foth, one of my spiritual fathers, is an incredible man of God. I mean, one of the men I most have admired in my lifetime as a Christ-like man. John Ashcroft's best friend growing up. Um... Uh, Dick Foe served for many years as the chairman of the National Presidential Prayer Breakfast that happens every February. Every president, all back for many, 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 many years, there's a presidential prayer breakfast every February. And Dick Foth was in charge of that. Um, and incredible things that God has done to this man. But he said one time, if Americans named God, Americans would name him, I do that I do. In fact, that's how we greet each other. What do you do? It'd be weird to go say, who are you? What do you do? God God doesn't introduce himself by what he does. I am that I am. Do you understand? God always puts being. Can you put up King James Version, Daniel 11.32, please? Daniel 11.32. God always puts being ahead of doing. Now, this is going to be a twist for us white Americans. Right, it's going to be a twist for us because we're we're really the Protestant ec- wasp ec- work ethic people. Daniel eleven thirty two says the people who know their God. This is in the King James. He puts being ahead of doing, and then he puts something ahead of being. 
And that's what we're talking about today in a bigger picture. Daniel 11.32, I'm not sure we're going to get it. Here we go. 11.32, yes. As such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Notice the verbs. Know, be, and do. That is always the order of Scripture. Know God, be the people of God, do the works of God. We tend to downplay the knowing God as far as our commitment to time being with Him. Yet the Bible says over and over we should meditate on Him day and night. We should meditate on Scriptures day and night. The Bible talks about how, how we should seek Him, wait on Him, pray, pray to Him. The Bible constantly pushes us toward more of a, uh, a monk-nun mentality. People that give themselves just to be with God. We, we shy away from that. Okay, and now obviously that doesn't mean we're not in the world. God says, I want you in the world, just not of it. But the priority is know God. And you can't know someone if you don't spend time with them. The more you spend time with God, the more you're going to know him. By the way, there is no shortcut to that. There is no shortcut to that. So if you don't have any devotional life, you're not going to go anywhere in depth with God. Sorry to tell you that. You're not going to go in depth with God if you have no devotional life. You might know God, you might experience God, you're going to go to heaven, but if you want to go deep in God in this life, you've got to spend time with Him. Know God, meditate on His Word, pray, worship Him, have a private life with the Lord. By the way, the people that know their God will what? Be strong. They're unshakable. They live in the world, but in a realm of security and poise and position in the spiritual realm that is not like other human beings. God, by the way, it's been said, God gives his greatest power and, and, and wisdom to those that he's the closest to. In other words, God is like the world. God gives to those he trusts the most, the most responsibility. The closer we are to him, the more he entrusts us to his stuff. And then they shall do exploits. Notice that doing is third. So God's introduction to us, I am that I am. What we're doing today is saying, Hey, let's go back to the beginning. This is what he said to me this summer when I got this at the end of May. Just meditate on that I am that I am. I had never meditated on it. You want to hit me first of all, that I am that I am? The same thing happened to Moses as to happen to every one of us. Do you know God wants every one of us to know him as the great I am? He said, this is my name, To all generations. My memorial name to all generations. I want this name memorialized. We hardly talk about that name. He says it's to every generation. I can tell you the more we meditate on this aspect of God, it's going to affect every area of your life. Every area of your life. Because it's the all-encompassing name. I am that I am. I am that I am means this in a nutshell. This is the main point of number one. He's ever-present. He's ever present. In Psalm 139, Psalm 139, 7 to 10, listen to these scriptures. And by the way, the application of this is really clear, but if you you don't get it, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll make it clear clear to you by explaining it in more detail. Psalm 139, verse 7. Where can I go from thy spirit? Where can I flee from thy presence? If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest parts of the sea, even there thy hand will lead me, and thy right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be at night, even the darkness is not dark to thee, and the night is as bright as day. Darkness and light are alike to thee. God's saying, my presence is everywhere. When you're in your deepest, darkest valley and moment and whatever, I'm there. I'm there. How do we know he's there? We have to fix our eyes on Jesus. We have to cast our cares upon the Lord. The application of his presence is this. Are we a people cultivating the awareness of his presence? If you're a believer... You don't leave His presence. His presence goes wherever you go. 
Now, there's two aspects to His presence. There's the abiding presence that is guaranteed with you all times. Then there's the manifested presence. The manifested presence is where you actually feel Him emotionally. I was a Christian three years and never once felt Him emotionally. The only emotion I ever had from the time I got born again until I got baptized in the Spirit was I felt the day after I got saved, not the same moment I got saved, but the next day, and within a couple weeks it started growing too, this peace that surpasses all comprehension. I knew Jesus was real and I knew I was saved because there was a witness of the Holy Spirit in me that was different than anything I'd ever experienced and I had this peace that I could not explain that I knew had to be His reality. And that peace never let me, left me, even in my worst sinful Christian days. And I had a lot of bad Christian days where I was living in sin. But that peace was always with me. But I never felt the presence of God. I never felt the love of God. The first few years I was saved, I would get frustrated when preachers would talk about how much they loved Jesus so much they cried. And they said, God loves you, don't you just feel it? And they'd be talking like that. I'd be going, no. I never felt His love. Emotionally. I believed it, and I had that peace, so I knew I had a witness, but I never felt it. I never cried. But after I got baptized spirit, my emotions got released. Oh, my goodness. I was, I, the next 14 months, I was beside myself. I had the greatest joy and the greatest sensitivity, and I, and I, was, I cried for the very first time in my life because of joy. I cried because of His love. I cried emotionally because I was feeling emotions from God and for God. And I'd never had that the first three and a half years I was saved. So I, I sympathize with Christians who have never felt God. But I'm here to tell you, you can feel God. By the way, our faith is not based on feelings. I'm glad I didn't have that. Because my faith got totally based on the Word and not on feelings at all. Which, by the way, is what it should be based on. Your faith should be totally based on Scripture without any experience. Amen. Because it's the truth. He is ever present. I'm praying in the application of this one, you will experience God's presence more and more. As I said just a moment ago, if you dedicate your job, the work of your hands, your responsibilities to be an ambassador, a representative of God, and to make it, whatever it is, an act of worship, no matter how mundane, doing the dishes. Do the dishes for Jesus. Do it as an act of worship. That's the book Brother Lawrence Practicing His Presence. That's all he ever became was a dishwasher. That book is legendary. It's a classic. He worshipped God doing dishes. That's all he ever achieved. His book still has outlived his life by hundreds of years. Cultivating the presence of God. I am that I am. He's the same. He's with us just like Moses in the burning bush. Number two, he is who he says he is. I am that I am means this. He's a person. He's not an it or a force. He has personality. He's a person. He's not a what, a when, a how, a where. He's not an it. He's not a cosmic chance. He's not an accident. He's not a big bang. He's not a God particle. He is a person with personality. And we have personhood and personality because we're made in His image. Which also means this. He has full-orbed emotions. He not only has a great intellect and a powerful will, and he makes choices, he feels. In the Gospels alone, a buddy of mine for his senior paper when he graduated from Bible college wrote and found in just the four Gospels 150 different expressions of emotion in Jesus. 150 different expressions of emotion. Psalms has all the emotions. He wrote Psalms. He is a person. Therefore, we can know Him personally. That is salvation, by the way. Number three, He is greater than any... I love this one. He is greater than any good thing you could ever dream or imagine. So try to think of the most incredibly good thing, awesome thing you could think of, and He is greater than that. He's always greater than that. He has what's called preeminence. That's a word you don't hear very much. By the way, these things all produce stuff. If He's ever present with you, you're going to have peace. If He's a person, you can have relationship, and that's going to meet our greatest need. Because the greatest need of a human being, psychologists have told, I've read this all my life, is to be loved and to give love. The greatest need of a human being is to be loved and to give love. 
In fact, we know in studies that have been done, there's books called The Blessing by Gary um, Chapman, that if a babies aren't touched, they can die. Babies have to be touched and held or it kills them. And there's stories in that book that just make you weep when you realize children who have never been affectionately touched in their life and they die at young ages, even like grade school. There's a story in there just tore me up when I read it. We are made to be loved, to get receive love, and to give love. He's a person. He fulfills that the best. He's greater than any good thing you think of. That means he's preeminent. Now let me give you this real quick. What does preeminence mean? It means defined, very distinguished in some way, above or before others, better than anybody else. Preeminence means greatest, leading, foremost, best, finest, chief, outstanding, excellent, excellence, prominent, marquee, superior, important, top, famous, renowned, exceedingly, celebrated, illustrious, supreme. In Greek, the word is protuo, it means to be first in rank or influence, who surpasses and exceeds the accomplishments of all others. He's preeminent. What does it mean that he's preeminent? He's greater than any good thing you ever think of? You have security. You have fulfillment. God is the greatest fulfillment. Humans are always trying to find fulfillment in something. Let God be your first source of fulfillment. Everything else will be satisfied. If God's not your first place of being satisfied and fulfilled, nothing's going to ultimately satisfy you. A lot of people think, well, I got God, but I want to get married. I want to get married. Well, you think marriage is going to be more fulfilling than God? It's not going to happen. You've got to be fulfilled in God first, then marriage is awesome. Anything you look to, oh, if I get that job, I get that dream job. Thank you, God, help me get that dream job. Because they really think inside that's where the fulfillment is going to be. Gang, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and they will be satisfied. They will be filled. They will be full. They will be fulfilled. Because if you hunger and thirst for anything more than Christ, who is that righteousness he's talking about, nothing will ultimately satisfy. But if you hunger and thirst for him, first and foremost, you'll be satisfied with everything else. It's amazing. And you will be filled. Number four, I am that I am implies and, 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 and applies. Impl- implies and applies. This powerful statement. Notice twice in Exodus 3, God told Moses his identification with human beings. Moses doesn't know God. All he knows now is he's I am that I am. And he says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mentioned this first hour. I'm driving home more now. God, for your lifetime, want you to know as much as any identity you could have, I'm the God of you. So say your name out loud. Dale. Say your name. Just say your name. I am the God of Dale. I am the God of Roger. Emily. I am the God. He wants, this infinite, perfect, holy, loving God wants to identify with you. You're saying everybody's trying to get their identity. There's all this identity teaching in the body of Christ. And I see this. I see this in Christians. They go after this radical amount of identity teaching. And the more they go after it, the more they need it. And I found a greater way to get your identity. Total security, total identity, total fulfillment. Die. (laughs) Just die. Just die to self. Just die to Dale. Die. Two most unimpressive people in the whole universe. Satan and Dale Crawl. Oh, he's got a self, low self-esteem problem. No, I don't have a self-esteem problem. I don't have a self. I do have a self. That's not true. I have a self. But I'm not concerned about self. I'm concerned about him. The more I die to myself and make him my identity and realize that he wants to identify with me, I mean, okay, can you get greater security and identity than saying, uh, God wants to call himself by my name? You guys missed that. Can you get greater security, identity, and fulfillment than to realize the God of the universe, the Creator, wants to identify Himself by your name? By your name. Yeah. Kind of changes everything, doesn't it? Selah. Pause. Wait. Think about that. Don? It's the God of Don Wickstam. <laughs> wow. The God of Mr. Feller. It's the God. Identifies by your name. 
See, you don't have to accomplish certain worldly goals to be somebody. Well, how much you make? Wow, six figures. Whoa. Right? That's like a mark. Isn't that like a mark? Oh, they, they got a six-figure income. Oh, they got two PhDs. Whoa. Jesus never graduated from college. <laughs> he changed the world. Still is. In fact, he rules the whole world. He didn't even have a degree. Well, what's the deal there? Oh, he was a carpenter for a while. Where's our identity? Let's get rid of it trying to be in self. Let's put it all in God. Let's God give us His identity. You get God's identity, you don't need any other identity. Do you need any other identity if you have God's identity? Oh, I am that I am. Fill in the blank. By the way, there's another aspect to that. So not only has preeminence, but now I am that I am implies this. I am blank. Now I don't have time to go into this because i got to wrap this up, but I just want to say I am blank. Right? I already told you that I am became Jesus Christ. And Jesus used that term. In fact, it got him really in trouble with the Pharisees. That led to his death. But he was sovereign over that too. But he said this, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am before Abraham. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life again. I am the true vine. I am whatever you need. Fill in the blank. Do you need health? I'm the healer. Do you need finances? I am the provider. Do you need wisdom? I am wisdom. Whatever you need, I am. Fill in the blank. I am that I am, literally. And it's present tense. It should be an ongoing... Can you understand? The more we cultivate a relationship with God and we make this applicable to our lives, it applies to everything. I meet young mothers with lots of little kids, and they're super tired. I mean, how many young mothers in America need a nap? Dads, would you give mom a nap? Would you make time for your wife to have a nap? I have all these young married women in our bodies, and they all have between two and five kids. And they're all in their 30s, and they're all burned out. They need a nap. I am the nap giver. I didn't make that up. I will make you lie down. In green pastures. What does he say? Tell him, I'm going to give you a nap. And it's going to be a nice place. Pretty, little water going by. No, I mean, even the world, right? Have running water. It's most conducive. You know what they tell you, that Eastern religion stuff. God started that in Psalm 23. I am the provider. Whatever you need, I have everything you need. My God shall supply everything you need. Last one, number five. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I said this first hour, i close with this. We are his representatives. Jesus came to represent the Father. He was the Father in the flesh. We represent him. Your highest call. Now, are you ready for this? Your high and my highest call, living on planet Earth, while we're breathing. Now, you can debate this. If you want to talk to me about it, I'd be glad to argue with you about it. But I really believe the number one reason every human being is on this planet is to glorify God. The Westminster Catechism is the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That is the ultimate statement of the ultimate catechism in the history of the church. The Westminster Catechism. The chief end of man. Why He exists. Why we're breathing this morning is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. He's a God that's enjoyable. Oh my goodness. Oh, I am joy. I believe when we see Jesus, the Bible says twice in the Bible, Old and New Testament, quote, from the Old Testament into the New. He was anointed with joy above all his companions. Jesus has more joy than all the human race put together. Now, we prophetic type people, we're really intense, so you don't think we're joyful. But I'm actually a cut up in private. (laughs) When I'm not yelling and intense. I believe my Jesus, who's way better than anything you can imagine, is the source of all joy. In fact, he says you're going to have, it says, what's that song we used to sing in the 70s? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return, 
and come a singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy will be upon their heads. Everlasting joy. He's got eternal, infinite joy. By the way, the Bible says that people enjoyed listening to him. Three days, no food. I'm telling you, he wasn't boring or stoic. Look at the lilies of the field. <laughs> he was a crack up. Children liked him. Children wouldn't like him if he wasn't that way. Isn't that right? So, here's what I want to pray. Lord, we need to meditate more. And you are the I am. By the way, remember that verse in 15. This will be my name for every generation. And I, I am so blown away since May when he gave me this in my quiet time. How seldom in the first 40 some years of my walk with the Lord, I ever even thought about the name, never studied it, never preached on it. And I realized it's like, it's like the source of everything about him. And what we need and who we're to become, you are representative of the great I am. You have the same calling of Moses. He sent you to Egypt to represent him. He sent you into the world to represent him, to represent him. What a high call. By the way, make no mistake about it. The Bible says eight times in the New Testament, he is no respecter of persons. He's not partial to any. You, everybody say me are as significant to God as Moses. Well, but he's, he's famous. He's got a big name. You know, not when he started. He was hiding out in the wilderness because he murdered a man, taking care of dirty sheep. Amen? When you go live in the desert. I mean, he lived literally in the desert. It's hot. Isn't God good? Would you bow your heads, please? Father, I thank you. Would you just ask the Lord right now, Father, I ask you to give us a greater revelation. Lord, no human preacher could possibly, possibly communicate the eternal truths of your word. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to increase in all of us a greater revelation of what it means that you are the great I am. Sarah, would you come up, please? Don, Emily. I am the great I am. He's the great I am. I am that I am. He is your great I am. He is not only your God, He is with you. He is in you if you've received Christ. Jesus said, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. He said He was the great I am. And He lives in you. He is the bread of life. He will give you all the food and sustenance you need. It's interesting we call bread not only food, we call it money. He'll supply your financial needs. I am the true vine. I am your connection to all the nurture and nutrients and life-giving stuff you need for life. I am the way. I will give you guidance and make you to be in the best path for your life. I am the truth. I am the ultimate reality. I will lead you into all truth. I will answer your questions. I will give you wisdom beyond all your teachers and all other men. I am the living water. Out of your inner being will flow rivers of living water. I am the living water. He who thir drinks of me will never thirst again. Would you just invite the truth of God's word, the truth of who he is, the truth of his name, the great I am, to take over your life. Expand in your life. Meditate on it. Ask the Holy Spirit to make it more experientially real. See it apply. If you need energy, He's, he's the creator of energy. Whatever you lack, He has it. I close with this scripture. We're going to sing this song and then Pastor Roger will close up. But I, this morning I said, Lord, give me something new for this message. And this morning in my quiet time, he spoke this to me. Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Why? Because he satisfies everything. 
Let's let him, amen? By the way, the more you let him satisfy every area of your life, the more he'll give you those other human things you've been wanting. What you try to get, you lose. What you lose, for his sake, he adds it back to you. It's an amazing principle. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I just want more of him. Amen? Would you tell him this morning, more than anything, I just want more of you. I receive all that you have for me. I receive your call in my life. You are the great I am.